Welcome to the Smith and Rowland Show. Let's join our host, Alan Smith and Jeff Rowland. And good morning, world. Welcome to the Smith and Rowland Podcast, where we discuss the issues that no one else wants to touch because we're right and everybody else is wrong. We'll touch such topics as Batman, Spider-Man. Exactly. And politics. And politics. Because they're all about the same. Yeah, that's all about the same thing. We are starting the Democrat National Convention. We started Monday, and um, I did want to get your idea on something. They have a makeshift pagan ritual altar set up outside. Yeah, and this has got us a little bit upset, a little bit stirred up, and we're telling everybody, hey, guys, it's later than you think. Free abortions. Free abortions. Waiting list. Yes. You can go to the DNC, sign up, and get a free abortion. At the same time, you go get your Coke. I don't know how they could do it any better. Yeah. yeah. They are trying to frame this whole election around the abortion issue Yeah. Yeah. on the Democrat side. They are upset that the abortion laws got taken away from Mm -hmm. the federal government down to the state governments, Mm -hmm. where it's supposed to be. Where it started. However, they're making that a key element, That's a key element. of their That's right. of this election cycle. Mm-hmm. The first night of the convention was about abortion. I heard a news commentator bring this up today, actually. He said he he only heard climate change mentioned last night one time. I actually heard it twice. Mm-hmm. Bernie Sanders brought it up, then Barack Obama brought it up. Night before I did not hear no, I never, climate change brought up at the convention. I'll, I'll be honest with you. After the first night, I was almost for abortion <laughs> if they would have been the ones that got, had gotten aborted. <laughs> okay. But I mean, I got right. okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, he's, off been off talking, track? he's been talking to Jason. A I, bit run too off much. Of, I run off the track. Forgive yeah. me. I'm doing the Catholic thing right now. <laughs> okay. All right. But you know, what is, you know what's odd? What's that? There is as much excitement going on outside the convention. Mm hmm. As there is inside the convention, because mm-hmm. you have the abortion clinic set up, then you have the protesters on behalf of Hamas. Mm-hmm. That's uh, several's been. I don't know how many they say so far has been arrested. They're expecting the crowds to grow each night. There was actually a bigger crowd there Monday night for protesting than there was last night, but wow. there was more people arrested. I think last night protesters was burning Israeli and American flags. At the same time, then there was a conflict between a citizen who was trying to rescue the flags, and then they there was an altercation. Police arrested several people. So on the news, depending on what news channel you, you're watching, they're doing a split screen. What's going on inside the convention, what's going on outside the convention. Wow. And I think both of those things, here's what it, it's speaking to me. Outside the convention – the election is being framed from the Democrat perspective. Yeah. It's about the abortion issue, and it's about how are we going to respond to what's going on with Israel. You had uh, several delegates that was protesting in terms of wanting the Democrat platform to embrace a weapons embargo to Israel. Mm -hmm. In other words, we can't sell any of our. They don't want us to to help Mm -hmm. Israel in this war. So those two issues, I think, is what the Democrats are hoping to frame this election around. They're talking about a whole lot of different things, but that's kind of what they're wanting to frame it around. Here's something else that that interested me that we'll talk about just if if I can get your comment on. Bernie Sanders spoke last night. He basically got up and cited everything that a socialist communist party would hope to achieve in their nation. And he said, this was his words, that he was going to help Kamala get that agenda passed, which was free health care for everybody, free education for everybody, paying for everybody's college bills. Now, that's that's already been started under Biden. He's already relieved a lot of student debt, but Bernie Sanders wants to make it to where you can go to university for free and the, the government pay for it. He was citing how that the government helped people during COVID and that the people of America has learned now that they can count on their government. So he was going to help Kamala Harris get all of these things passed, you know, free this, free that, government take care of this, and the government take care of that, where basically, you know, we would work for the government, the government would take all of our money. (laughs) Which we're halfway there. Yeah, we're, we're, we're on that journey. That was interesting to me. 
I guess it interested me because Bernie Sanders got done the same way Joe Biden got done this time. When Bernie Sanders was primarying Hillary Clinton, he was actually beating Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. He was outperforming Hillary Clinton, Mm -hmm. and the Democrat Party got involved and kind of silenced and pushed Bernie Sanders out of the way so Hillary could get the nomination. Now they've pushed Joe Biden out of the way so Kamala could get the nomination. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a flip-flop. The Democrat Party was afraid of socialism with Bernie. Now they're embracing it with Kamala. And that's basically what you have. She is, in effect, a socialist. Mm -hmm. And she's got Bernie Sanders helping her. That kind of thing really bothers me. You get to the abortion thing, and we we both know that that's nothing more than a pagan ritual Mm -hmm. of child sacrifice, according to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. They were having pagan rituals outside the DNC. They were offering sacrifices to Molech and Baal. Mm Mm-hmm. That's, so that's, that's, that's kind of where that's at politically. The parallels are how did the church allow this to take place in the political world? And when I make that statement, I'm saying that because I firmly believe that the church has a responsibility in that area. And because of a weakened state in the church, that's what's allowed the, the political world to get to that place. The social issues used to belong to the church, transgenderism, homosexual lifestyle, all of these things. What mentioned polit- that wasn't a political thing back when we were growing up. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, politics has now taken over that social calendar, those social events, and the political world is regulating those social events instead of the church speaking out against it. And because of that weakened state, we have what we have in the political world. Mm -hmm. So what saith the guru and the man of all wisdom who couldn't be with us, so Alan's filling in for him. Go ahead, Alan, and speak to that. (laughs) We have to start with some absolutes so that we can build a case for truth. One of the absolutes is the major absolute, I think, is that for a couple hundred years now, the preacher's set the standards for the country and then the country tended to follow the standards that the preachers preached and that's just the truth yeah where we are today is because of a breakdown in our pulpits what you're seeing played out in our government and our country today is an exact correlation between the preaching of god's word or the not the preaching of god's word If you want to know what's been preached in our pulpits the last 30, 40 years, just look at our state of our country. That's right. Because in Corinthians, I forget the address of the Scripture, but in Corinthians it says that God gave the authority to the church to speak into the heavenlies the perfect will of God. Where the church is to speak, it says, unto principalities and powers, it even says, to declare the truth of God. So it's had to have been that we've stopped speaking the truth of God. And we can get upset in everything we want to do, but our fruit, just look at the fruit of where we are right now, the church. The church used to lead our country. Yeah. And the church is still, let me say this, leading our country. That's right. <clears throat> and this is, shows you the state of our churches. It does. As a overall, I'm not saying there's not specific churches out there doing the work, but as a country, we used to be known as a Christian nation, yeah, and now we're just looking, trying to find some true Christians because of the compromise and the apostasy that's crept into our churches, uh, just like it says in the book of Jude. We were warned by him, Jesus' half-brother, that this apostate, apostasy, apostate church would show up on the scenes in these last days, which we know we're in. And now we're so we're not to be too surprised at the apostate church, and we can blame it on Catholicism all we want to. But apostate's not just given over to the Catholic Church. Apostate has to be built off of individuals' hearts. And just like I believe in the Catholic Church, you've got true believers. But also, the Baptist churches, Presbyterian Methodist churches, Lutheran churches, you don't need to be hollering at the Catholics anymore. No, I agree. Because we are have become just as apostate. I totally agree. And I also lay it at the feet of just the of such bad Bible teaching, replacement theology beating the leader 
of poor biblical understanding. So where the church has replaced Israel. So it started this trend of replacement thinking. So now we're caught up into this thing about replacing everything that went viral. And so everybody thinks you need to replace everything that has been. And so that's what replacement theology does. It says that the church church replaces Israel. So the only thing I can tell you, Jeff, and also I've done a little reading since our last podcast, and most of dominionism is replacement theology. It, that's the foundation for it's, it. It's the foundation. You can, you now, there's, a, a, there's yeah. a few out there that's not. They claim not to be. They claim not to be, but, but they contradict themselves. But they contradict themselves. If you have a foundation of replacement theology, mm-hmm. you that can lead you to a dominionist-type uh, yeah, eschatology. Well, it has to be there. Yeah, to be in agreement with yourself, yeah. you do. Yeah, yeah. And and also even with Calvinism, you have to. It always leads in That's to right. replacement theology That's because right. you're the chosen. You know, it doesn't make any distinctions yeah. between the nation Israel and the church, which is the mystery, or if you will, the secret. The Bible says yeah. the the body of Christ is the secret that was hidden in God yeah. and was not revealed until Acts chapter 9 and, and on. And so if you can't make that distinction in this secret and this mystery that's hidden in the Scripture, then you'll make a false assumption that the mystery or the secret of the church replaces Israel. Yeah. But nowhere, that, that won't even do basic math because the church, the mystery, is the hidden factor that was revealed. And Israel is the prophetic factor that has always been spoken of. Mm-hmm. And just because God reveals a secret, it doesn't stop the prophecies of God. Yeah. The replacement, I mean, trans, gay, every, everything, all of that's replacement, replacement theology. That's right. I'm going to pl- replace, I, I think I need to be a female, so I'll replace my maleness. Yeah. With the, or trans, I'm in the wrong body. So, I'm going yeah. to be, so all of this replacement thinking, it evades, it It runs away from reality and from truth. I'm a male. You're a male. That she's a female. Female. The nation Israel. The church is a mystery. This whole thing, Jeff, is not that complicated. And I know dominionists want to, and this is where we get in trouble into the church and with government, Jeff. Where we get in trouble is we do almost have some egg on our face with dominion theology teaching. Because dominionists want to take over all of the government, and this government be a Christian government. So that's what dominionism is, and and the world, and I understand that. And that will happen. Well, I say it'll be happen. That will be offered when Jesus comes at his second coming. Mm-hmm. But there's some that won't accept it then. Absolutely. <laughs> you see, so. Yeah, that's exactly so, right. So, but there will be a time that he'll rule and reign, and he'll have dominion over the heavens and the earth. But it's important for, as a Bible student, that you know what time it is in the Scriptures and you know where we are uh, right now. We are not living. And you have some different movements. Dominion now was a movement or Mm -hmm. is a movement. And a lot of the people that we would embrace and consider friends are definitely dominion. They they cite us, uh, the reason they're against us as dispensational in our persuasion, we are dispensational with no exclusions. That's exactly right. We are, we are dispensational, yeah. and we exclude no one. We don't even exclude a dominionist because in dispensational teaching, just because some of your doctrine's incorrect, it doesn't disqualify you from salvation. That's exactly right. So everybody needs Or to, even from fellowship. Or for fellowship, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it yeah. Does, doesn't do that yeah. because we always know sooner or later they'll get it right. Yeah, and, and, and it's <laughs> totally up to them if they want to hang around seven years longer than number. That's just totally— It's okay. Up, it's okay. It's we'll, okay. We'll, we'll be up there waiting But on. you bring up an interesting point, so, several points, what you were saying. We, we uh, read a— an article. Why is why is the state of the world like it is? Let me say this first before I even go where I was going to go. There, I view the darkness and the principality that we're wrestling against. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, mm-hmm. but against principalities and powers. <clears throat> I review this replacement idea. It starts with it, it, you know the church replacing right. Israel. When you get to the government level. What the government seems to want to do is replace God himself. That's exactly right. So it's all the way up. Then when you get to that point, 
you're at, I think, the extreme demonic darkness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so shining light there, I know is hard. But the church being so weak, while you were talking, I was reminded of an article we read just yesterday of a survey from Arizona Christian University that cited 51% of pastors do not have a biblical worldview. Wow. 51 percent of pastors think about it do not have a biblical worldview at least 50 percent of those filling the pulpits are not presenting to their congregation a biblical worldview mm -hmm. so the congregation then in turn is coming out of there making conclusions based off of the of a secular filter that's right to judge things by mm -hmm. and where that leads you is is in places like this in the democrat party you have people who will say, hallelujah, Jesus is Lord. And because he's Lord, I'm free to go get an abortion. Mm -hmm. That's where it leads. There is such confusion in their mind that their process of thought can't be right. We're talking about making distinctions in Scripture. We're dealing with people that can't make dis distinctions in the natural world. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think that goes back to this thing of leadership in the church. You and I looked, uh, what, listened to a podcast. Well, it wasn't a podcast. It was just a teaching. And we talked about it a little bit yesterday from Rick Joyner. Mm -hmm. He did during the uh, War in 24 conference. Right. That, yeah. And in that conference, Rick was talking about preparing for the coming war. Mm -hmm. that we were facing. And he, he uh, emphasized that he's not talking about a, a literal war with guns and ammunition. He was talking about in the heavenlies, in the right. spiritual war. Though I think that we are teeter-tottering on the edge with such explosive divisiveness right. that I wouldn't be surprised in a literal war. But I'm saying he talked about the, the what's been coined as the five-fold ministry of Ephesians. I, he didn't use that term, but that's the term that most people use to describe that passage. I don't really like that label. To me, it's more like how Jesus orchestrated the structure of this church yeah. he was building when he said upon this rock, I will build, build my, my church. church. That's right. And he set forth a, a structure. It was apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. This is just my observation, and I, I hope I'm wrong. But we, t <laughs> we talked about this a little bit yesterday. It appears as though that the church has rejected that structure. Right. And we are in the process of continuing to reject that structure. Mm -hmm. No longer do we talk about the office of an apostle with some dispensational teachings they would say that that office died mm -hmm. with the apostles. Right. You and I know that that's, that's not what would be considered true dispensationalism because mm -hmm. most people don't know what true dispensationalism mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between the function and the office. Mm -hmm. There is a separation between the apostle of today and the apostles mm -hmm. of the New Testament. We believe that. Then you've got the prophetic office. That's almost uh, laughed at and scorned mm -hmm. because some have robbed that title and they're prophesying their own will instead of the will of God. Mm -hmm. So that office is being rejected. The uh, evangelist office is almost no more. Mm -hmm. I mean, churches don't even Hard have revivals. No, you can't even find an evangelist now. You can mention revival to some churches, and they don't even know what you're talking about. That's they right. don't know what the word is. The office of pastor is leaving. The people that is uh, coming out of the seminaries, 50% of them don't have a biblical worldview. Mm-hmm. So they can say they're a pastor, but they're not really a pastor. I think it goes back to the Old Testament scriptures where the prophet Jeremiah said, woe be to the pastors. That's right. Teaching is now almost ineffective. Number one, people that's don't amazing. listen. That's amazing. And number two, the teachers that's teaching is teaching false doctrine. That structure, that fundamental structure seems to be missing. Is it because God's not calling it? No, I believe God's still calling it. But I do believe the people are rejecting it. Right. I do believe that. And because of that weakened structure <clears throat> in the church, we are becoming more and more and more apostate mm -hmm. with more of a secular worldview that lends itself to a psychological teaching on Sunday right. instead of the Word of God being taught. Those are my thoughts. And I think that's what is fueling this demonic monster that is trying to replace God
mm-hmm. and we call it government. If we leave that alone, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against those principalities. Mm-hmm. You cannot fulfill that passage by disengaging from society and not proclaiming truth. Right. What is your thoughts? <clears throat> we'll talk about you? the worldview here, Jeff. There's a survey done here by Arizona Christian University, and, ta- and it, it makes a survey of annual worldviews mm-hmm. to follow up on your comment there. And it says here, of American adult born-again Christians, only 13% hold a consistently a biblical worldview. I have problems saying that you are an American adult born-again Christian. You're not. I You're mean, just how can, not. How can you be a Christian and they're saying 13% have a biblical worldview. I I think we're about to rephrase it. Yeah, it needs to be rephrased. you got, you got to have yeah. enough of, uh, evidence there to condemn you of being a Christian. Yeah. And I just don't believe that. <laughs> if you don't have a biblical worldview, how can you profess to be a Christian? I'm confused over now, that. Now, this survey, you got to understand, was taken. They were talking to people that confessed of being a Christian. Right. That's the, and that's the way it should be yeah, worded right. in the article. They, they, These are from mm, professing Christians. Professing yeah. Christians. And based off of those questions to these professing Christians, let's say if they had 100, only 13 out of 100 said, yes, I have a, I consistently uh, have a biblical world yeah. view. Yeah. And I'm like, how can you be a Christian without a... <laughs> To me, that needs to be 100%. <laughs> or, yeah. How can you? Can, and let me just throw I just, this. I, that's I, just tough for me. I want to throw this out there at you to consider. Worldview is important. Yeah, it's important. I mean, the whole Word of God is about shaping your mm-hmm. worldview. Mm-hmm. He's the creator of the world. So, but let me, let me just throw this out there. 13% have a biblical worldview. Does that mean that 87% of those that attend the church does not have a, a biblical worldview. I'm just. So, I'm asking well, so the question. So I'm going to be. I'm that, going to be a, a devil's advocate. I'm here. sure you will. Let's say to be lenient, uh, fifty to seventy-eight percent would have that. So fifty well, percent. If you got a fifty percent hole in a boat, is it going to sink? Yeah. <laughs> That's my question. How big a hole? Does it take to well, sink the church? I don't want to be guilty of being. I Please don't care don't. what I'm guilty. No, you of, don't. Of you, I thought, why are you uh, yeah, starting I don't out? know why I said that. No, I think you, I was just trying well, to. You ate a polite. cookie or something. Well, uh, you know, you sugar got up. Okay. Yeah. What happened? I thought I had a fleeting thought of Chad Grider. And yeah. Well, Casey all of a sudden Clark. you, you just did messed this, me up. You had this kind thought. So you don't know how to process those well. Yeah, that's true. So you're about to mess up. If over half or even half of the church that's attending Mm -hmm. church does not have a biblical worldview. I'm going to suggest that probably half of the leadership body of the church does not have a biblical worldview. That would be true. When you're producing pastors coming out of seminary, don't have half of them don't have a biblical worldview. Well, most of them don't don't believe the inerrancy of the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. No. The deity of Christ, the virgin birth. They don't believe in those things. Well, why, pray tell, would you go to be a pastor? I have why no clue. You, huh? Listen, I you did run that. a hardware or something. Yeah, I, I pastored for 20 years. It is not a career that you choose because it's just a good career. So I don't know why they're doing it outside of the fact, is this a strategy sent from hell yeah. to put people in place yeah, that, would, so. that would weaken the body? So now if you embrace that thought, what you're basically saying is, is that Satan's got as many called preachers out there as God does. Wow, sounds pretty biblical to me. Wheat and the tares and what have you. Just saying. And it used to not be that way. That's mm-hmm. the th- and the way we can evidence that is this nation, regardless of what Johnny Enlow says, this nation <laughs> is not getting better; it's getting worse. If you are into replacement theology, and you deny the rapture of the church, and by the way, we need to just say this while we're talking because I know there's going to be more podcasts that we're going to do about this subject mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it's growing in intensity. Where it come from? I have no idea, but everybody's blaming the rapture of the church on John Darby and C.I. Schofield. For the life of me, can't figure that out. C.I. Schofield did not come up with the rapture of the church. Mm -hmm. The apostle Paul did. He's the one that wrote about it. 
So if you've got a problem with a writing about the rapture, you've got a problem with the Bible. Well, as I've said before, Jeff, the embarrassing thought to have, one, a thought that you don't like to bring up, you have to know a certain amount of Bible before you understand the rapture of the church. Yeah. Uh, I hate to put it like that, but yeah. because, and a lot of people say, well, Alan, where's the rapture of the church? I say, well, we need to go through, through a little Bible teaching of understanding how God laid out the Bible, what God's up to, what he's doing, how does God think to get up to. See, the Apostle Paul is assuming that you have a lot of this knowledge in you. And what we're discovering is Christians today don't don't have much knowledge within them of the Word of God. So when you come to these scriptures, you you wrestle with them, but the writers assuming you already know more Bible. That's right. That's, right. So That's exactly they, right. They can't They're writing on the basis of the foundation you, that, yeah, of what went right, of what's yeah. already went on. So. That's the embarrassing conversation. Yes, it is. And I know a lot of these people are pretty smart and all of the above are, that are dominionists, and I, I get all that. But you can be pretty smart and know what you know. Now, the dominionist mindset, Jeff, is correct. They're just applying it to the wrong time. Well, that's exactly right. That's all they're that's doing. That's exactly right. That's all they're We're doing. We're in agreement with the fundamental yeah, basics of yeah. what they're saying. Yeah. We're just in disagreement with the timing that it yeah, takes place. The only place. thing you have to do is look around you. Look out the window. What's going on out here? And you can you can take what's going on out here and line it up with the Word of God. Absolutely. And you don't have to. You don't have to wonder. Rather than tried to sell a bill of goods it's not happening yet now it's going to happen but it's not happening yet and then you got to act like it's well you don't have enough faith you need to act like it's happening and if enough of us will act like it's happening then it'll happen and can i just say this this is last really nerve last on. nerve yeah last i got nerve. one nerve left yeah only, last nerve. only one i've heard people say this escapism thing i'm about to puke well let yeah. me are you into this yeah. escape oh these pre-trib guys they just they're just wanting to escape 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 Number one, we're saved to escape hell. So escapism is a biblical doctrine. It is. We are told that with every temptation that comes against us, God will make a way of escape. escape. So escapism is there. Now, that being said, I also want to say that for those that believe that either the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled, Right. And or that it is we are somewhere in between chapter 6 and 19 right now mm-hmm. by looking around and saying, well, we've got all these earthquakes, they're increasing, we've got all this. Jesus said this about the tribulation. He said, this is going to be a time unlike has ever been before, and there will never be a time like it afterwards. That's what he says. Mm-hmm. Now, with that information that come from the lips of our Lord as he spoke it, to say it can't get much, it can't get no worse than what it's. Oh yeah, I got to tell you, apparently you to. don't know about the power of God and the Word of God because it it's it, going to get worse. It's going to get worse, a lot worse, uh, a lot so bad that in, unless He shortens the days, no flesh would be saved. Mm-hmm. We haven't got to that point yet. If, in fact, and to those who believe that, okay, we're in the kingdom age now, I don't know how you reconcile that to your replacement thinking. If the church replaced Israel, the kingdom age is only a thousand years, and we're still here. Mm-hmm. And this is 2024. There's, see, there's nothing yeah, about yeah, all that that lines I up. I mean, I think part of the confusion, Jeff, comes in when people say, <laughs> well, the kingdom's now. I mean... To be a citizen of the kingdom and to couple with that the understanding that you're an ambassador of the kingdom lets you know that you're living in a country that's not your kingdom. That's right. So it's just, That's right. You, the it, two doesn't it, mix. You can't, you can't make that's it right. work. So, that's right. But we are citizens. Yes. And the kingdom and, is now in and, my heart. In our hearts, yes. Yeah. But we are ambassadors. That's right which we're, uh, indicates we're in a foreign country. Yeah. So we're not in the kingdom of God now. And then a lot of dominionists believe, I've, I've heard it taught, that if you'll believe in the dominion theology, we get enough people believing it, then it'll happen. And i got news for you. No man knows when that's going to happen. And, and it's not up to us to dictate timing to no, God. We're not hot. We're not holding. God's we're not. in charge of time. We're not. Yeah. And at the same point, I would rally with the dominionist in saying we do need to take over the government 
Mm-hmm. I'm f- I'm a proponent of that. I am I'd, too. I'd vote. I for am it. too. I'd vote for. It. I think we'd have a lot better government if Christians were in charge of it. I'm with you. Uh, I'm, I would I, agree. I, I, I can also say we'd have a lot more compassion if Christians were in charge of it. Mm-hmm. I would hope uh, so. Yeah, mm-hmm. I really be- I really believe that. I'm with uh, who who was it? We watched Doug Wilson. I'm with Doug Wilson when he said non-believers would be way better off under a government of yeah, Christianity yeah, 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 of course. than they are under well, the that's present what, that, government. That influence is what allows these other religions just to even be here. Absolutely. Is that Christian influence. That's exactly right. And uh, so it's, it's, it's just a shame. It goes on here to say, Jeff, that 21% of born-again teens believe they will live with God in eternity because of a personal decision to trust Christ. But nearly double that believe in the reincarnation. We're back to the same point on some of these surveys. Those that believe in reincarnation, Alan, ain't born again. Mm. They're not saved. They've never trusted Christ. The truth of that statement is, how many, what, Rick, can you read that statement one more time? 25% relegate to preteens that That they're going to live with. 21%. 21%. Yeah. They'll live with God in eternity. Yeah, okay. But they're saying twice that, 42%. Believe in reincarnation, not of that 21, but of another. Right, right. Basically, and this is supposed to be a survey of professing Christians. So you've got people that's professing to be Christian who believe in reincarnation. Those two don't mix. You can't be born again. Reincarnation's not biblical, if anybody's asking. It's not biblical at all. You know, it's like the whole evolution theory that, Mm -hmm. you know, we're evolving. The only proof of evolution I've ever seen works backwards. Like, for example, I have a son-in-law named Chad. Mm -hmm. Okay, He's supposed to be human. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's true. If you meet him, it looks like evolution's going backwards. Chad, I'm so sorry. I'm just saying. Chad, I'm so glad that you married Allie, but I'm so sad that you have inherited this father-in-law. Well, Casey's the same way. Same, same. Poor old T.T. and Ollie. I don't, you know, I, I pray for them daily. Well, they go on to say this, Jeff. Roughly 25% of parents of preteens say that the church, it's, it's uh, the church's responsibility to instill a Christian worldview in their church, in their children. I don't think that 25% of parents are saved. What do you think? Well, yeah, not only that, but uh, I would say they're not parenting either. It's the parents' responsibility to teach the children. The Bible teaches that. Well, listen to this. Only 51% of senior pastors have a consistent biblical world. Right, view. right. And we're back to what we were talking about wow. before. Because th- that proves to me that the church itself, as an institution, is reject- they're rejecting the biblical structure for the church. They're rejecting it. They're saying we don't want real pastors. We want teachers having itching ears. Well, that's the reason a lot of them are in their eschatology. They're saying that the Book of Revelation happened uh, in ninety. Yeah, absolutely. AD. So they're saying, well, so none of that pertains. None to None of us. that pertains to us. It's and historical. So, yes, narrative. historical yeah. narrative. We're just moving on, hunky dory. Yeah, everything's going to get uh, better and better. Everything's going to get better and better. Yeah. and we're going to live happily ever after. As we embrace the yeah. the homosexual lifestyle, and as we embrace, we're going to make it Can better. I tell you? I heard Barack Obama speaking last night, and that's basically what his message was: the way to get along. With, he was he was pushing that you know we need to live in harmony we're not that far apart we need unity I'm paraphrasing what he said but he was gathering it around the fact that hey all we have to do is just allow people the freedom to do whatever they want to do be whatever they want to be and all will be well we'll live in this utopian world that was his message wow that I, is I, totally I didn't watch it. separated from the word of God and also separated from any type of reasoning. Yeah, it's insanity. It's insanity. Okay, 51% of senior pastors, 30% of the associate pastors don't hold a consistent worldview. <laughs> that means they're, they're out of seminary. Oh, my goodness. 13% of teaching pastors, only 13% of them hold a biblical worldview. So what's being taught? A youth pastors, 12%. Believe in a consistent world. So now we know why only 13% of the te- preteens and teens hold a. Smith and Rowland show 100% <laughs> consistency of a biblical worldview. And if that hurts your feelings, that's go fly it. a kite. That's exactly right. Don't you think, though, we can conclude by that? 
that there is a lack of the teaching of the Word of God. Well, there is, and we even have, you know, people that we would consider we could be friendly with. The other podcasters are constantly, their only consistency is is to bang against dispensationalists. Yeah. But my advice to them is you need to study your Bible more if you really want to do, do this right. I've uh, never heard someone come against a dispensationalist that really understands dispensationalism. No, you hadn't heard They don't understand it. Well, they don't have enough Bible in them to no, understand they don't. it. From a dominionist point of view, yeah. I understand what they're doing. Right. I can see them taking this scripture, perverting it or pulling out of it a meaning that's not there as it relates to the context. I can see it. I've never met somebody yet that comes against dispensationalism that really fully understands no, no. the word of God in relationship. Yeah, because if they're making their accusations, you're like, boy, you're framing this completely out of the context yeah, of the scripture. That's right. And I'm not saying that just to be a, a low blow. I'm, I'm like, where do we even start yeah. to have a constructive argument about this? Yeah, right. I, it's almost as though you have to, we're, I think we're in this season. We're going to have to take people back to the basics because we have to, I think we have to embrace at some point, we got 50% of our congregation sitting out there that don't have a biblical worldview. Mm-hmm. We just have to embrace that yeah. fact. Then So then we have to start. The office of evangelist needs to come back because 50% of the congregation's lost. Mm-hmm. They need Christ. They've never really seen their need for a Savior. And so there needs to be that evangelizing inside of the church. Mm-hmm. And I've heard, I used to hear preachers say this. I was a little confused by it at the time because this was 30 years ago. They used to say that the greatest mission field on the earth is inside the church. I've heard that. And I think it, I think they're right. We're seeing the evidence of that now. It's extremely scary. However, there's good news. And far be it from me not to share good news. Far be it. Far be it. Go ahead and far be it. Okay. The good news is the Smith and Rowland podcast will be here on a regular, consistent basis. That's exactly basis. right. Now, that's good news. Truth, telling people. All right, Rowley, let's pick up again here tomorrow. Yeah, let's do it. And we'll, we'll spit us out another one. All right. So have a good day, everybody. You as well. Go and trust in Christ. We are in the last days, but let's go out with a bang. Absolutely. And lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. And let's shout all the way out to glory. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining today's Smith & Rowan Show. You can check out our website at kingdompropheticsociety.org and our daily unplugged podcast at smithandrollinshow.podbean.com. You can also join us on Amazon, Apple, or Spotify.